Hello angels and welcome back to my channel. This is another Solves True Crime case. So I hope your Christmas and New Year's were great. I am actually wearing a Christmas jumper currently but we're just not going to talk about it because I am, I'm not ready for Christmas to be over yet. Also do you like me hair? How cute is it? I seen this on um, Instagram it looked adorable so I was like oh my god I need to let my hair. So yeah I did it. I think it's so cute. Anyway guys I'm just gonna get started. So this is the case of Mary Flora Bell who was born on May 26th 1957 in Newcastle. She lived with her mum Betty Bell and her dad Billy Bell. Her mum was a prostitute who worked seven days a week and a lot of the work she did was inside of the house. So from a very young age Mary seen these men coming in and out of the house. Sometimes her mum would go away for weeks at a time, you know going places so she could get more jobs. Mary was just kind of left by herself in the house at like a very very young age. Betty had actually had Mary when she was only 17 years old and Mary was her first child. Betty wasn't in a good mental place to raise a child and she knew this. She really badly struggled with bipolar disorder and due to this bipolar disorder Betty had actually tried to kill Mary multiple times when Mary was still just an infant. One example was when Mary was only a couple of months old and Betty actually threw her out of a two-story window. Another time Mary accidentally swallowed loads of her mom's sleeping pills and Mary got really ill because of this. This can't be confirmed that her mom definitely did give her these pills but multiple people witnessed Betty giving Mary these pills. She gave her these sleeping pills as if they were like sweets when Mary was only a toddler. Betty actually thought about putting Mary up for adoption and multiple times she'd actually asked members of her family if they would take Mary on but all of them said no. There was a separate incident when our family did actually say yeah we will take them on but by that time Betty had changed her mind. Mary's father was called Billy Bell and he was a known alcoholic. He was known to the police for being quite violent and he was in trouble a lot by them and from Mary's mum's prostitution and her dad's alcoholism Mary was neglected really badly as a child like she didn't she never was shown love really so they actually lived in Scotsworth in Newcastle and at this point it was very deprived and it was really struggling still from the war and there were many well-known criminals that lived in this area. Mary and all the other kids on her estate from the ages of about two were allowed to just play on the street by themselves like unsupervised. Sometimes you know they'd be supervised by older children being there or maybe they had like an older sibling but primarily they were on their own outside. Sometimes children would be playing outside through the night because a lot of their mums were prostitutes so the kind of safest place for them I guess was with the other kids. Almost half of the houses on this estate housed a prostitute. So Mary's school friends recall her having a really really bad temper. One minute she would be fine and then you know something would upset her or someone would say something to annoy her or you know get her angry and she would just flip. Apparently when she was nine years old all the other girls were too scared to play with her and if they seen Mary coming over they would run away from her because they were all so scared of her because of her temper. One of her school friends actually said that when Mary would snap with anger she would like her head would shake, her eyes would go like really wide, sometimes she would even grab people by the throat and strangle them and she'd like show no emotion. A classmate of Mary's actually remembers seeing her choke a girl and this girl she was choking Mary was choking this girl so hard that this girl was going bright red luckily an older girl seen what was happening and broke it up but I mean obviously that's really really worrying behaviour. Mary's teachers were aware of how violent she was and sometimes they even witnessed some of these things but they would have children come to them constantly tell them that you know she'd strangled them one child even said that she'd put a cigarette out on the face. The teachers really punished Mary even after witnessing these things firsthand they really punished her which is terrible because she definitely should have been punished because she was just consistently getting away with these things and it was kind of normalised. It was normal for her to lose her temper and strangle people. Mary's best friend was actually her next door neighbour Norma Bell um, and they weren't related they just had the same second name. She was actually two years older than Mary Norma had some sort of mental disabilities and I don't like using this term but she was kind of a lot slower than Mary if you know what I mean so it was easy for Mary to dominate everything that they did even though Mary was actually younger. Mary 
had a lot more common sense and she was a lot more street smart than Norma was. So again, this allowed Mary to dominate things a lot. Norma did whatever Mary said and it was actually a joke at the time, obviously before everything happened, but when they were younger and they were best friends, there was a joke saying, if Mary told Norma to jump off the time bridge, Norma would do it. That's how much people knew that Norma would do anything that Mary would say. Partly this was probably due to Norma's mental disabilities, but it was also partly due with how manipulative Mary was. On May 11th, 1968, 10 year old Mary and 12 year old Norma picked up a local boy who was only three years old and they took him to buy some sweets at the shop. One hour later, he was found walking alone, dazed, confused, and he was bleeding. Police and an ambulance were called, and luckily, me like a full recovery was okay, but the girls were never punished. And I don't think they were even asked about it or questioned, really. The next day, a local woman went to the police station to report that Mary had tried to strangle her daughter, Pauline. Pauline and Mary were friends, and they were playing in the sandpit together. When Mary snapped, Norma held Pauline down while Mary started strangling her. Mary then started grabbing handfuls of sand and putting it in Pauline's mouth. And when it wasn't going down her mouth quick enough, Mary started shoving her fingers down her throat to push the sand down. Pauline says she remembers how scared she was when this was happening. And she said that she looked and Norma looked really scared at one point and kind of like came back off of Pauline which meant that luckily Pauline could escape and run home and tell her mum what had happened. However, when Pauline went to the police station, she didn't tell them everything, so she didn't tell them about the whole sand thing, because she was scared of what Mary would do if Mary found out that she'd snitched on her. She was like absolutely petrified of Mary. So no action was taken by police and Mary got away with it again. And maybe Mary might have got in trouble if they hadn't known about the sand, but most likely she wouldn't have. Most likely she still would have got away with it anyway. Two weeks later, on May 25th, 1968, four-year-old Martin was out on the streets playing with his friends. Around this area where the children were playing, there was lots of abandoned and like derelict houses and buildings. And on this day, Martin and his friends were playing in one of these abandoned houses and his friend went upstairs and seen him lying down and he thought he had an accident. So this little boy ran and told Martin's mom. Martin's mom ran to this house to see what was wrong with our son. And there was already a huge crowd of people outside of the building. Martin's mom said she saw a man hold Martin in his arms and Martin just looked limp and he was really cold. So she took her a cardio off and put it on him. After that, she said the ambulance just rushed straight past her, grabbed Martin and took him to the hospital. Sadly, Martin was actually pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. Due to the suspicious circumstances around Martin's death, police were called in to kind of investigate and see what had happened. And at first I thought that Martin might have taken tablets that were on the top floor that a previous tenant had left there. And maybe Martin had mistaken these for sweets or something because he was only four. However, police did think that maybe someone had force fed him these tablets. Another theory was Martin was scared of stairs and heights and everything like that. And some people think that somebody helped them up the stairs and he turned around, looked down and seen how high they were and died of shock. In Martin's post-mortem, there was no cause of death found and it was determined that he died of natural causes at the age of four years old. The next day, which was May the 26th, Mary was playing at Norma's house. Norma's dad actually found Mary trying to choke Norma and you know, he got in, he separated them, but he just assumed that maybe it was like a violent game they were playing or something like that. He didn't really think much of it. So he just told them not to play the game anymore because it was dangerous. The next day, May 27th, police were called into a local nursery as it had been broken into over the weekend. Nothing had actually been stolen and it looked like it had just been broken into to be messed up. Police actually found four bits of paper with little notes on them. So one of these pieces of paper read, I made her so that I may come back. Some of them didn't really make much sense. They were kind of rambling on calling police the f word another one said we murder watch out and another one read we did murder martin brown f off you b word you know most likely this was aimed at police police regarded these notes as kids just kind of playing a cruel joke on them and didn't really think much of it especially with the fact the cause of death wasn't determined to be murder 
the same day of this nursery breaking, Mary went into school. So Mary actually wrote about Martin's death and she wrote, there were crowds of people outside of an old house. I asked what the matter was. There had been a boy who had just laid down and died. And underneath this story, Mary who drew a picture of Martin laying down on the floor with a little bottle drawn next to him, labelled tablets. And it was also a picture of a workman walking over and discovering his body. Martin's auntie actually used to babysit an old man Mary sometimes. So Martin's mom June used to sometimes see the girls at a sister's house. And the girls were always asking her like, how do you feel? Do you miss your child? And you know, June thought this was really nice. She thought it was sweet. She thought they were checking up on her. However, before Martin's funeral, Mary and Norma turned up at June's house and asked if they could see Martin. And June said she was just so confused and she turned to the girls and said, you know Martin's dead, you, you can't see him. And Mary replied saying, oh, I know he's dead. I wanna see him in his coffin. June said she literally just slammed the door in the faces and broke down crying. In the months following Martin's death, tons of these abandoned buildings and houses were knocked down to make plans safer for kids, basically, because of what had happened to Martin. On July the 31st, 1968, Mary, Norma and all the other kids on the estate all gathered to see these buildings being knocked down. There, the girls began playing with a three-year-old boy named Brian Howe. And then they led him to a field so they could play on the field instead. And that night, Brian was reported missing. Neighbours started theorising that maybe he'd been abducted, maybe he'd got hurt, maybe he was lost out there by himself. So tons of neighbours offered to go searching and Mary and Norma also went round to help search. Mary and Norma were specifically involved in helping Brian's mum. Apparently they were skipping, they were dancing and they were even singing as they were leading Brian's mum all over the neighbourhood. That same night, Brian's body was found in a field and sadly he had been murdered. He was found half naked and chunks of his hair had been cut off and thrown like around him. He had a couple of stab wounds on his legs which were most likely made with the same scissors that were used to cut his hair. Brian's cause of death was determined to be strangulation and these stab wounds on his legs were actually held to be after he died. However, his cause of death being strangulation wasn't known for quite a while because it seemed to have been done so gently. Usually when strangulation is the cause of death, there is bruising around the throat and it's quite obvious. But in this case, it was very gentle. This led police to believe it was done by a child because a child is obviously a lot weaker than an adult. It seemed as if the murder had applied gradual pressure over an amount of time and not applying all the pressure at once. Among all the stab wounds on him, it seemed that there was an M carved on his stomach and it seemed like it was originally an N that was changed into an M. So half of this was carved at the time of his death and half it was carved much later. Due to the similarities of Brian's murder and Martin's death, police decided to reopen Martin's case. After a reinvestigation, Martin's death was labelled a homicide and these two killings were instantly linked. Police announced that they were looking for a child killer. Mary and Norma, Mary in particular, seemed to be very interested in this police investigation. Police actually remember that Mary was at all of the conferences they held and they said you couldn't miss her because she was so obviously trying to pay attention to it and trying to really listen to what they were saying. At this point, it was common knowledge that Norma and Mary were in trouble a lot for violent things like strangling people or like how before they took that boy off of the street. It was known that they'd done things like that in the past. Mary had even bragged to a girl in the playground that she'd strangled a little boy. At this point, Mary was 11 years old and police had so many neighbours and just people who knew Mary telling them to look into Mary. So due to all these people phoning in and you know giving Mary a tip basically, police decided that they needed to go and speak to her. However, when they tried, Mary's father Billy answered the door and he wouldn't let them speak to her and he even threatened police that he would get his dog on them if they didn't leave her alone. However, just after this, police got the breakthrough that they needed to be able to arrest her. A nine-year-old boy came forward and said he had witnessed the murder of Brian. This nine-year-old boy had the mental age of a four-year-old, so at the time, I don't think he really understood the severity 
of what he'd witnessed. But when he told his parents, obviously they did, they knew how severe it was and went straight to the police. This witness told police that Brian had told Mary he had a sore throat. So Mary said that he would massage it for him to make it better. Mary started massaging Brian's throat, but a grip got tighter and tighter and tighter until she ended up killing him. From this witness account, police were able to bring Mary and Norma into the police station for questioning. During the day, police would question them and then at night time, they would go into care separately because police didn't want any input from the parents or anything. So police got in contact with the schools and got Mary and Norma's school books because they wanted to compare the writing in these school books to the notes from the nursery that was broken into. The handwriting couldn't 100% be confirmed to be Mary's, but it looked very, very similar. Since police already had the girls' school books, they decided to just look through them to see if there was anything odd or suspicious in the books. And that's when they found Mary's story that she wrote about Martin the day after he was murdered. Now, if you remember a saying, she drew a little picture of a bottle on the bottom of the note. Now, this was, again, a breakthrough for police because this wasn't public knowledge. It wasn't released to the press that there was a tablet bottle there and the only way that Mary would have known about this bottle of tablets would have been if she was at the scene of the crime. So even though Martin's cause of death couldn't be exactly identified, like I said before, police thought that maybe someone had force fed him these tablets and police thought that maybe Norma and Mary had, you know, force fed him these tablets. From this last piece of evidence, police had enough to charge Norma and Mary on August the 8th, 1968, on two murders. So trial started four months later in November, where both girls said they were innocent and basically blamed each other. During this trial, Mary was cross-examined and just kind of asked loads of questions. And one of these questions, he asked Mary if she'd ever strangled a pigeon before. Mary just broke down crying and you know, the court were just kind of waiting for it to calm down and stop, but she didn't. So court had to actually be paused. And it just seemed very false, the emotion. It was shown very quickly in the trial that Mary didn't really have much emotion. She lacked basic human emotion and even when she did show it, it was very false, put on, over dramatic, over the top. She showed absolutely no remorse throughout, even when they were talking about these two murdered babies. She showed no remorse. When police asked Mary about these notes left in the nursery, she admitted that she did leave them there, but she said it was only for a giggle. She said they weren't actually truthful and she didn't actually kill Martin. Due to Mary's lack of emotion, she was looked at by multiple psychiatrists. All of them came back with the diagnosis that Mary was a psychopath. Norma was acquitted on the grounds that she was simple-minded. That's what they said, that she was simple-minded and that Mary led her to do everything. Police believe that Norma didn't actually kill either of the boys, she just witnessed it. Police believe that she didn't understand the weight and the implications of what she was doing. Well, what Mary was doing to these little boys. Mary was found guilty of manslaughter due to her diagnosis of being a psychopath. The judge said because she had a recognised medical condition and because she was only 11 years old, she needed rehabilitation, not punishment. However, she was too young to be sectioned under the Mental Health Act and sent to a psychiatric ward. So instead, she was sent to a boarding school. Her mum, Betty, would visit her regularly. Mary always blamed Betty for the way that she turned out. One day, Mary actually wrote Betty a letter, begging Betty to go to court and take responsibility for what she had done. Mary believed that if a man went to court and told them how she raised her, then they wouldn't think that Mary was guilty anymore and they would instead imprison her mom, which obviously isn't how it works because Mary still killed these boys. Betty really broke down after everything happened with her daughter. She became an alcoholic, she barely left the house, she was a nervous wreck and she fully just broke down. However, many people believe that the breakdown wasn't really because of Mary. And because Mary was sat in prison, it was more so because the way people were viewing her and how there was a very negative image of Betty. And as heartbroken as Betty said she was about Mary, she still went and did interviews all the time. She sold stories and pictures that Mary drew in the past to the press. 
literally like every week. After a few years of being in the boarding school, Mary was put into an open prison. This is basically like a prison where they have a lot more responsibility. They're not locked in the cells and they're kind of trusted to serve the time. Either they have jobs or a lot will go out through the day and there's like a lot more trust. In 1977, when Mary was 20 years old, she escaped prison, allegedly to lose her virginity. I don't know how true that is, but I read that on quite a few sources. However, she was quickly found and she lost her privileges for 28 days. In 1980, after serving 12 years, she was deemed to no longer be a threat to society and she was released. She was given full anonymity sorry i don't know how to say that word properly anonymity i think i said it right and she was given a full new identity so she now has a new name nobody knows who she is um i think she lives in the gated area four years after her release on the 16th anniversary of martin's death in 1984 mary gave birth to her first child she had a daughter who was granted anonymity until she was 18 years old mary never planned on telling a daughter about anything however when her daughter was only 14 years old reporters found the address mary and their daughter had to leave the house with sheets over the head so the press couldn't get any pictures of the faces so due to this mary went to court and she said that she wanted her daughter to have lifelong anonymity not until she was 18 because reporters had seen her at the age of 14 and had seen her face so in four years you don't really change that much so it's kind of like the would recognise that they had a scene in four years. So the court agreed that Mary and her daughter weren't safe if the daughter wasn't kept anonymous. So her anonymity was extended to her whole life. In 2009, 51-year-old Mary became a grandmother and this anonymity stretched onto the granddaughter. So a lot of people have very conflicting opinions about the anonymity in this case in every case really because a lot of people have the argument of why should they get anonymity when they've committed these crimes why should they get to live out their lives when the people they've killed obviously can't live out their lives anymore and i think it's a completely valid argument but i also do think it's a very valid argument when people you know playing devil's advocate when people say yeah but she was a child when she committed these murders so i don't know also, do you really think it's Mary's child and grandchild's fault? Should their lives be ruined for it? I don't know. It's it is a it's a tough one. It's really tricky. And I completely understand both sides of the argument. Anyway, I hope you guys are interested in that case. I will link all the videos below, like I always do, of the videos I used to research. However, there was a really important thing that Eleanor O'Neill said in that video of a fact she found, and I thought it was so interesting. So an author paid Mary Bell £50,000 to give an inside fact and knowledge of this case so that he could write a book. £50,000? She was given £50,000 for killing two innocent little babies? Like, what is wrong with people? But also, do you like me hair? How cute is it? looks so cute i'm literally gonna have to take an instagram photo just because the hair looks so adorable because you know what it is like it looks like little, little sausages like, i don't know do you know what i mean like little, little sausages like do you only buy from like the shop and they've got like sausages all attached together anyway guys i love you all thanks for watching make sure to like and subscribe dm me comment any cases that you've got in the future i've got a few more that people have asked us to do lined up anyway i'm gonna love you and i'm gonna leave you bye angels